abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea. Whoa, this sounds like a Pepto-Bismol commercial. I thought mm. we were talking about diverticulitis. And diverticulosis. We have an expert here, Dun Dr. Duncan Rosario. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for the kind invitation to talk about your colon. There you go. Welcome to Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Weenie. I'm Dr. Paul Zalzo. So today we're going to talk about something called diverticulosis slash diverticulitis. We're going to talk about what it is, what you feel like when you have it, and how to treat it. So let's start at the beginning. What is it? So uh, diverticula refer to little pouches that develop in your large intestine or in your colon. Are okay. they supposed to be there? They're not supposed to be there. Uh, the, the colon is a uh, muscular organ. It has uh, muscles that go in two directions, muscles yeah. that go all the way around in a circle and muscles that go along the direction of the colon. Okay. But the challenge is, uh, well, imagine when you're a kid and you're playing with Play-Doh. Mm -hmm. You put Play-Doh in your hands, and if you squeeze it really, really tight, the Play-Doh comes out between your fingers. Oh. And so the same thing happens with your colon. Okay. If you don't have enough fiber in your diet, you, when your colon contracts, it produces a, something called segmentation. It increases the pressure in the colon and the areas of weakness where the blood vessels go through the intestinal wall, they start to pouch out between the muscles. So okay. Neat description of it. I will never play with Play-Doh again, <laughs> but that is a neat description. Okay. So, so this is a, a slightly disease of age. So it, it's, it, not, it's not the kids aren't getting this typically. Correct. So it's associated with uh, age, associated with low fiber intake, associated right. with smoking, obesity, yeah. and there's also a, a clear correlation with microbiome alteration. That's okay. a new field of research. In yeah, we're learning that this affects almost every aspect of our lives. Genetic, Absolutely. any genetic factors? Absolutely. There's a familial uh, correlation with diverticulosis as well. Okay. And you mentioned age. What age, I'm afraid to ask, are we talking <laughs> about? So it depends upon where you live. So in countries like Egypt, diverticulosis is extremely common, uh, uh, sorry, uncommon, affecting uh, one or two in 100 people. Okay. So one or two percent in Egypt. If you move to North America, one third of people at the age of 50 will have diverticulosis. So a okay. huge difference. So in once you turn 50, you move to Egypt. That's the plan. <laughs> The, the food is fabulous. I right? was going to say, are we primarily blaming the, the, the standard North American diet where we are plant deficient or fiber deficient? Correct. So yeah. the, the clearest correlation is with the SAD diet, sure. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it's felt to be related to the low roughage, low fiber intake of the North What's American SAD diet. What's SAD stand for? Standard American diet, and it's, really? it is a bit sad. As opposed to sad. Yeah, yeah, less. and so so when you're eating more plants, not only are you more regular, but you're straining less, because even that intra uh, increase in pressure can lead to these outpouches. Right? Uh, absolutely, and so and so the the theory is that the predominant uh, challenge is one of uh, dietary intake, but there's a clear correlation with what we call in general surgery the three F's: fiber, yeah. fluid, and physical activity, because while the fiber is important, fluid is very necessary to uh, en enhance our bowel mot uh, motility and bowel motions and physical activity. Walking, as you know, we're physiologically designed to walk, and walking enhances GI motility. So Brad's three gonna, Fs. Just, Brad's just, gonna go Sesame Street on you here. Just so like, anyone that's watching is like, wait a second, he said the three Fs. Physical <laughs> is not an F, but phonetically, it sounds like an F. Phonetically. So, yeah, so don't freak out. Just like uh, reading, yeah. writing, and arithmetic. Exactly. So, I, exactly. I, I saw where you were going with that. Okay, so now we know why people kind of get these outpouchings or these diverticuli. The average person's not showing up at their doctor, though, saying, hey, I feel like I got some outpouchings in my colon. One specific segment, right? It's mostly near the very end, like your, Correct. your sigmoid colon primarily. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they're, they're not showing up saying I got these outpouchings, but we know they're happening. Why do people end up getting investigated or how, do, how does this become a problem for us? Why do we care? So the presence of these pouches is correlated with symptoms uh, such as abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloating. The, the, that correlation is very weak, though. Okay. The typical presentation is not of diverticulosis, but the typical presentation is diverticulitis. Okay. So osis is the pouches are there. Correct. Itis is those things are getting inflamed and infected. Correct. Correct. Okay. And, and the main cause of the infection itself, like why, did, why does that little pouch all of a sudden get infected? So it's not completely clear, but it's felt that either a bit of stool or a food particle gets lodged in one of these pouches, causes local inflammation, and then it actually perforates the little pouch. Oh. Because while the colon wall itself is thick, it has multiple layers of muscle, 
a diverticulum is thin. It's okay. actually an outpouching between the muscles, so it's an area of weakness. If it gets inflamed, it can actually perforate, and that's what produces diverticulitis. Okay. Now, would these people be showing with relatively acute pain in a very specific location? It tends to be acute pain, left lower side of the abdomen, but diverticula can occur anywhere in the colon okay. and can produce pain anywhere in the abdomen. Uh, yeah, if you have diverticulitis on the right side of your colon, it can even mimic appendicitis. Okay. okay. And so it is one of the more leading cause of bowel perforation if you're sort of looking at a perforated... In, in North America, it's probably the number one cause of bowel perforation. So let's talk about how common. How common is diverticulosis kind of as we get older and how common is diverticulitis in those people? So, so as I mentioned, in North America, over the age of 50, uh, about a third of North Americans have okay. diverticula, but only a tiny portion, you know, uh, uh, two to five percent of those people will actually get diverticulitis, okay. which is the perforation. Okay. That's pretty common. Yeah, I it is, say, unfortunately. You know I mean? right. And so you can, if you have diverticulosis, y you can avoid the diverticulitis with the high fiber diet, the healthy diet. So, so that helps. The challenge is once you have the diverticula, yeah, they're not going away. Uh, yes. The only way to get rid of diverticula is with a, a bowel resection, which is not an appropriate treatment for diverticulosis. Okay. Sometimes it's needed for diverticulitis, though. Okay, so, so now you know you got the diverticulosis, you got the symptoms of diverticulitis, you see your doctor, the physical exam confirms that part, and you're like, well, still could be a bunch of other things. Are there any tests that we can order, or you can order, when you see it referred, say, hey, can you come see this person? What tests are going to be done to rule in or rule out that diagnosis? So after a physical examination, there are some standard lab investigations that we do. We typically see patients with diverticulitis in the emergency department, sure. and so we do a complete blood count, and we would typically see an elevation of patient white blood cells. Yep. And the typical test that we do to confirm the diagnosis is an X-ray called a CAT scan. Okay. which shows localized inflammation typically at the site of the uh, uh, sigmoid colon, in the area of inflammation. We treat, and if patients have not had a relatively recent colonoscopy, we would suggest a colonoscopy typically 8 to 12 weeks later to make sure there are no other pathologies present because sometimes colon cancer can mimic diverticulitis. Oh. Okay. okay. And that CAT scan, is there contrast or barium or anything, or is it just a regular CAT So it's scan? just a regular CT. Uh, even a non-contrast enhanced CT will demonstrate the infl inflammation uh, associated with diverticulitis. Okay. Uh, we're, we're looking not only for inflammation, but we're also looking for air outside the bowel. Oh, because, right. you know, we, we divide diverticulitis into microperforation, macro perforation and free perforation. These okay. are kind of the, the concepts that we use in general surgery to stratify treatment. And then I'm assuming your treatment decision is going to vary depending on what you find then on the CT. So let's start at the most basic form. You see, you have some diverticuli, they are inflamed on the CT scan, but there's no free air and you're not a super sick patient, what would be the first-line treatment for diverticulitis? Uh, first-line treatment would be oral antibiotics. Okay. We would typically use a combination of uh, ciprofloxacin and uh, metronidazole. That combination is very effective for the outpatient management of diverticulitis. We actually just did a video about how you're not supposed to drink alcohol with metronidazole because it there can cause go. an antibuse-like reaction. Correct. There you go. Okay, so first-line. Five to seven days kind of thing? Correct. A week, a week of treatment is typically all that's required. That'll Mo settle down that type one sort of least invasive sort of diverticulitis. Correct. Correct. Do you also counsel at that point saying, hey, get some fiber in your diet? So when patients have active diverticulitis, we actually have them on a low fiber diet to reduce uh, transit through the inflamed segment of colon. Ironically. But, but once they're fully uh, re recuperated, uh, the objective is to get patients on a high fiber diet. and. I know this is a medical channel, but basically what we tell patients is you need to have enough fiber in your diet yeah. and fluid and physical activity so that, so that you're having soft, strain-free bowel movements. That's the objective. Yeah, okay, so that's stage one. Stage two, the more serious um, inflammation. Correct, so uh, the macro perforation, uh, basically a larger hole in the intestine will produce uh, more uh, local inflammation. Yeah. It allows bacteria and air from inside the uh, colon to get out. It can result in the formation of a pocket of infection called an abscess. Okay. It can produce uh, a tunnel to uh, adjacent organs such as the bladder or the vagina. The fistula. Uh, correct. The dreaded fistula. Okay. And so these people are getting 
intravenous antibiotics and an operation always or not necessarily? So, uh, much of the time, those patients would be getting intravenous antibiotics and sometimes drainage. Okay. So our uh, expert physicians in the uh, in interventional radiology department uh, can put a tube or a catheter into a pocket of infection. And, and we usually use uh, size as the criteria. If the abscess seen on CAT scan is small, three or four centimeters, IV antibiotics are generally effective. Okay. If the abscess is more than four centimeters, we would typically ask our IR doctors to put a tube or a catheter in to drain that collection of infection. Now, our viewers are really smart. They're gonna say, well, there's a hole there and stools leaking into my abdomen where it's not supposed to be. Isn't it just gonna keep being a problem? So uh, a certain percentage of the time, yes. Okay. But uh, treating uh, uh, diverticulitis with surgery uh, when surgery is indicated is always best done in an elective setting. Oh, right. Okay. So, okay. so our bodies can wall it off, though. I really Absolutely. was trying to get you to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah we, we have this fabulous structure in the abdomen. Uh, you're, you may have discussed with your viewers this apron called the omentum, yeah, the, fatty the apron. policeman mm -hmm. of the abdomen. And so if you have inflammation, whether it's appendicitis or diverticulitis or perforated ulcer, this fatty layer will wrap itself around uh, the inflamed organ. To save you, essentially, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so there's a hole in my bowel, dear doctor. Dear Liza. <laughs> yes. And you said electively treat it. So how long after one of these flare-ups or something are you saying okay or, or is it right after the first time something like this happens That's you go okay let's question. treat this surgically or let's say you got three strikes then we're going to treat this surgically. So, so, so it depends in the acute setting uh, if one has you know the the largest type of perforation a free perforation which is basically a big hole in the intestine allowing the free flow of stool and bacteria out of the intestine that's the time when I I call up uh, my orthopedic surgeon who has a hip on the board and say, guys, I've got a P1 free air. Really sick patient. A really sick patient because they've got bacteria coming out of their colon. This patient's very ill. They need an urgent operation. To and save I tell you, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I need to bump your case to save their life. Okay. We operate, we take out that section of intestine with the hole and we m m would typically do what's called a colostomy. So right. we bring the intestine to the abdominal wall to allow the waste to drain outside to allow all the infection to clear. Temporarily. Temporarily, and then we can close that at a second operation. Okay, so that's the most urgent version. Correct, that's so urgent then, surgery. So then for, for Paul's kind of suggestions, to so say you have the significant perforation, but you treat with IV antibiotics and you kind of get better, you drain the abscess, that person goes home, they're sitting home thinking, what are the chances A, that this is gonna happen again? And depending on what that number is, how do I decide? Let's, let's book the elective. Let's book the elective surgery to deal with this problem. So uh, elective surgery for the treatment of recurrent diverticulitis or complicated diverticulitis typically uh, is uh, related to patients who have an abscess that has been treated with uh, drainage. Uh, sometimes what happens is if you have diverticulitis over and over again the bowel will narrow down and produce a stricture, okay. and so a, it'll block your bowels. Or we mentioned the dreaded fistula, where a perforation will tunnel into bladder or vagina. So th those are the typical indications where we recommend surgery. Right. We like to do surgery on an elective basis because yep. we can plan it, we can optimize patients, we can give them a bowel preparation to empty out all the bacteria and stool from their uh, colon and it gives us the best chance of doing an operation and not needing a bag or a colostomy. Right. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of an art then. You kind of talk with the patient what their needs are. If someone said, listen, I just don't want to, I don't want a colostomy or I don't want to have colon surgery. You'd be like, okay, just know that you might have it again. Absolutely. And next time it might be more serious. Then we might be forced to do an urgent operation that is not ideal. Absolutely. But it's a kind of discussion that you have. It, it, it is. It's okay. a discussion. Uh, uh, in the olden days, we were a bit more rigid about, you know, the three strikes and your out rule. Okay. But we realize now that uh, colon surgery is a serious undertaking. It has yeah. risk associated with it. Sure. And we're always attempting to minimize the use of surgery unless it's really clinically indicated. Love that. Okay. So bottom line, this is very common. It can be very bad. It is treatable and you can avoid it as much as possible with a good diet and lifestyle. Correct, don't smoke, eat your fiber, uh, drink your fluid, and get your physical activity. And move to Egypt. Move to Egypt, those are, those are great. that's great advice for most chronic disease, actually. It is, isn't it? Okay, now you know all about diverticulosis, diverticulitis, maybe even more than you wanted to know. 
If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel, share it with someone that you think will find it interesting. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. Thank you, Dr. Rosario. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.